Hello, welcome to the Science for Policy podcast. My name's Toby, and uh, someone pointed out to me recently that I never actually say who I am or why on earth I'm here. So uh, I will. My name's Toby Wardman, and I work for the European Commission's Scientific Advice Mechanism. So now you know. And today I'm joined by Dr. Barbara Pilatz and Dr. Thomas Shinko, both researchers at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, or IIASA, or IASA. So uh, Barbara Pilatz is a researcher in the Water Security Research Group, part of IASA's Biodiversity and Natural Resources Program. She has a particular interest in improving the social and policy relevance of scientific research, and she has experience in interacting with policymakers, students, and the public. And Thomas Shinko has a background in economics and environmental system sciences, and he now leads IASA's Equity and Justice Research Group. He focuses on assessing the impacts and distribution of climate-related risks, how to manage those risks, and especially their ethical and politico-economic implications in the context of a just transition towards a sustainable future. So, Barbara and Thomas, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Toby. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Toby. So you work in, as far as I can tell, two quite different areas, water security and managing climate risk. So perhaps you can start by indicating the overlap between your work. Why are you both here talking to me at the same time? So first of all, Toby, I think with our equity and justice research group, we are touching upon many different uh, challenges and issues that societies are facing. So already from a topical perspective, water, water challenges are in essence a, a justice question. So I think already in terms of topics, we are quite overlapping and we're also collaborating on, on different research projects and have done so in the past and will do so in the future. But what I think personally where Barbara and I are quite overlapping in our research is our methodological approach so that we go beyond traditional uh, research methods and uh, approaches in the way of not only doing interdisciplinary research, but also doing transdisciplinary research. And I think maybe the first important thing here is, is to clarify the difference between those two terms. So I think very often interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinary are used interchangeably in different research fields and communities. And while interdisciplinary research is in essence defined by research beyond the confines of single disciplines, Transdisciplinary research acknowledges the equal validity of knowledge provided by researchers and other societal actors, including policymakers, including decision makers, but also including laypersons, and to foster collaboration between these spheres. And I think that's where Barbara and I and also other researchers at IASA are really joining forces to move that kind of, of research forward. Yeah, no, just to uh, just to add here that uh, in the space where where we work in the water security group, I mean, water security at the end is no more than making sure that there is enough water for all the uses that are needed for the environment now and in the future. So there is an embedded component of equity there because we just need to make sure that there is water for everyone now and also in the in the future. No, so it's. Uh, it's an embedded uh, principle of, uh, of water security. And I very much, uh, sorry, just building on what Thomas said, I, I very much agree um, with this idea that we need to be clear as well about what transdisciplinary is as opposed to interdisciplinary, because we've tried as scientists for a long time to become interdisciplinary, but I think the magnitude of the challenges that we face these days uh, make us realize that it's not only uh, a matter of bringing you know, the knowledge domain of scientists to address these problems, we need to bring many other type of knowledge to the table. Right, so your concept of transdisciplinarity is that it goes beyond just scientific research to other kinds of research, other kinds of knowledge. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's the whole idea that, you know, it's no longer the, the domain of science to address these problems. I mean, it is the reality when you when you have to try to bring your two cents, you know, as scientists to solve complex sustainability challenges, you realize that many other type of knowledges, including the practical knowledge, you know, that uh, decision makers and yeah, other stakeholders have uh, are very important to actually design the, you know, the right solutions and actually uh, make the right questions as well. So at what point in the process do these other kinds of knowledge come in? 
is it like you generate your specifically scientific knowledge first and you work on combining that with other kinds of knowledge when it comes to synthesis and making it policy relevant or whatever? Or do you bring the other stuff in all the way along when you're doing your research? So I think what you described in the beginning, Toby, is is in essence multidisciplinary research. So here we would have uh, the classic research style where researchers focus on their own disciplines, maybe do have a bit of interaction, maybe exchange data, qualitative, quantitative data. And towards the end of the project, there might be a scientific outreach event to policy and decision makers. Um, sometimes researchers would even call this interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary research, but I, I think Barbara and I would not call it that way. And for us, if you want to do proper transdisciplinary research, this starts already when you write your research proposal, actually, when you define your research questions, when you set up your stakeholder engagement processes. So transdisciplinary research really means engaging with society from the very beginning on identifying problems, identifying uh, research methods, how to address these problems. And we have done that in, in our research. We've written proposals together with uh, stakeholders, with policymakers, with decision makers. That's uh, not the easy way, but it really adds a lot to research and to the potential impact of research that we are doing. I would say as well what uh, what I think it makes a big difference uh, when you enter this field of transdisciplinary science. I think a big motivation for those of us as scientists that we engage in this in this kind of processes that we really want to go beyond our scientific impact. You know, on our uh, peer review papers, I think we are driven by different kind of incentives, and we just see you know that we face very complex problems, uh, and we just would like you know that uh, our research also contributes and generates this social impact. Very interestingly, I think once you start uh, getting into this field, you realize that, I mean, we are all driven by our own values, no? So you as a scientist have a certain understanding about how the, you know, your, I don't know, your world uh, works and what is a problem, what is a solution, or how would you address certain problems and so on. And I think once you go into this transdisciplinary space, you realize that sometimes even it's not only about defining solutions, you know, that are socially acceptable or, uh, or realistically can be a applying uh, to the ground. It's also about sometimes uh, even need to reformulate your own questions because maybe the type of question uh, you were driven, I don't know, to investigate, you know, water security. And you might think that this is because there is not enough know-how on insufficient technologies or investments into technologies. And then you suddenly realize that it has nothing to do with that when you start speaking with the stakeholders. And then you start acknowledging that, you know, it's more, I don't know, political economy considerations or governance aspects. So it's it's a very um, necessary, I think, a research field also because it helps framing the right questions that, you know, that we need to address. And we have an ongoing research project at YASA where myself, Barbara and other colleagues are involved in where we actually do research on transdisciplinary research processes. So we try to assess and systematize different approaches to doing transdisciplinary research. And based on interviews with experts in this field, we actually found out that there are, broadly speaking, two different kinds of transdisciplinary research projects that are sometimes linked. The first one being transdisciplinary research involving stakeholders to identify problems, to identify what is at stake and what needs to be addressed. And in a second step, there could be further on transdisciplinary processes that actually try to co-design, co-develop solutions to address these questions that have been asked in the first process. Very often it's only the first one or the second one, but sometimes you also have both aspects in the transdisciplinary research. And I think Barbara was referring to a very important aspect, namely the term solutions. I think as researchers, scientists, what when we usually work in our disciplines, we are not offering solutions. We are offering options that could become solutions in representative democratic processes decided by political representatives in political systems. But when it comes to transdisciplinary research, I think research can even go a step further in co-designing these solutions, uh, chipping in our scientific ideas, but then working with stakeholders from different uh, parts of society 
to identify solutions. So I think this also allows researchers to go a bit beyond what, what we are usually doing, offering options. But here we could really contribute more towards solutions finding. And this kind of work you're describing still sits in the domain of the scientist, the researcher. Because in discussions of science advice, there's often a distinction made between the kind of the generation of a discovery that happens first and then what's done with it is a, is a separate thing. And one traditional way of looking at it is that the scientist domain is the first half, then the second half, what you do with the options that the scientist comes up with, that, that's down to the policymakers. So like in practical terms, the scientist obviously leads on the research and, and might be involved a bit in the dialogue between the two. But when it comes to the practical implications, they, they leave well alone. That's up to the democratic decision making. And for what you're saying, it sounds like, at least in transdisciplinary research, the scientist is involved much more. They kind of go much further along that path towards policy implementation. Not all the way uh, towards the, the, uh, the democratic uh, decision-making process, I think. We are getting a step closer, I think. And for me, science advice is fundamentally different to transdisciplinary research, as, as I would see it. So science advice is more what you described in the beginning, that researchers are doing the work maybe in an interdisciplinary context, maybe exchanging with policy decision makers every now and then. But it's more like scientists eventually giving advice, telling policy decision makers what to do, what could be done, putting the options on the table. And in transdisciplinary research, uh, I think it also boils down to the to the method that is eventually applied. So here we are working with a specific participatory methods to move beyond just having this unidirectional science advice uh, channel, but really involving with oftentimes very creative uh, research methods, very different uh, aspects of society and very different stakeholders. But of course, just to reiterate, I don't think scientists should be part of this uh, democratic policy and decision-making process. We can offer options and we can support with transdisciplinary processes in identifying some of these options that could become solutions. So we could go a step further than we used to do before, but uh, it's not our job to really take these decisions. Yeah, no, I I, um, I totally agree with uh, what uh, Thomas is saying. And I think as scientists, our role really is not to uh, influence the decision making, to uh, provide the best evidence and clearly outline its uncertainties no? behind the information that we are providing rather than, you know, making, having any any stake in the, in the decision to be made. Yes, I totally agree. So the way it's been framed so far, this sounds like a, a very practical thing, right? So you do this stuff because it makes your work, firstly, more accurate, more corresponding to reality, but also more useful, you know, more suitable to be used to solve real problems. Okay, so fine. But then we started off talking about equity and justice. And in fact, Thomas, your research group is called the Equity and Justice Research Group. And that makes it sound like more of a normative thing. You know, we do this because... We ought to. It's a matter of moral fairness that we involve people in the process of addressing and solving the problems they face. So, so which is it? Or is it both? I would say it's both, yeah. And I would actually say that all the major global challenges that we see at the core of these challenges, we see uh, ethical justice challenges. So we see how are goods and bets distributed? What are the processes to it? arrive at this distribution. So I think uh, if we don't tackle these implicit, oftentimes implicit justice considerations, we will not be able to solve our grand global challenges. And very often these objective and perceived injustices improve very important barriers to the implementation of policies, uh, such as in the area of sustainable development and the climate and biodiversity crisis. Justice issues are really inherent to all decision making, albeit with varying potential for disagreement and conflict. And we talk about justice both in terms of recognition and procedure and distribution in terms of outcomes. And these are all crucial aspects in, in designing and implementing co production processes in transdisciplinary research as well. So, this co production or the meaningful collaboration between researchers and societal stakeholders who are impacted by or make use of research outcomes can really improve the quality, legitimacy, and also the accessibility of research products 
And I think most importantly, it could also increase potential for knowledge co-production to support the action towards desired outcomes. So the processes, just processes, also could support the development of just outcomes and increase political feasibility. So it's both. It's an ethical challenge. It's a justice challenge that we, we have to address. And uh, it's also working towards more politically feasible, practical, realistic solutions. Yeah, makes sense. You mentioned as part of that explanation, this term, which I've seen also in your writing, which I made a note to ask you about, which is the term procedural justice or justice in procedures. So excuse my ignorance, but what does that mean exactly? So the term justice is most most often used for referring to the justice of allocations of goods and bads in, in end states or outcomes. So in end state theories of justice, uh, Justice is defined in terms of some overall property of a distribution of, for example, resources, welfare, or greenhouse gas emissions, or other goods and bads. For example, this distribution can be egalitarian, or whether the lowest position in the distribution is as high as it can be, as Rawls' uh, difference principle would require. Procedural justice instead asks about the process by which the final outcome has arisen. So in an extreme case, one could say that the sh shape of the final distribution is completely irrelevant. According to some philosophers, uh, justice is entirely a matter of the sequence of prior events that created the outcome. So Rawls, for example, put forward this concept of perfect procedural justice, where a procedure is such that it, if it is followed, a just outcome is guaranteed. For most philosophers, however, and I wouldn't call myself a philosopher, but a social scientist, economist who is interested in philosophy, I would say that the justice of a procedure is intricately linked to the justice of the outcomes that it tends to produce when it's applied. So I think it's not either or, it's really procedural justice and outcome-oriented justice goes hand in hand. And we have to think about both when we uh, also talk about transdisciplinary research and co-production of hopefully just outcomes. Mm -hmm. Barbara, do you want to add anything? Yeah, no, I mean, actually, um, I, I just wanted to say that I think the justice and the and the equity component, it's, it's fully embedded uh, all the way down because at the end of the day, I see that many, I mean, when we do science advice or when we do transdisciplinary projects, at the end of the day, you know, the, the results that we are generating that eventually will be translated into policies. And many people will have to live with those decisions uh, and will have to live with the implications of those decisions. So I think it is really, really important, you know, that these people also have a voice and at stake, you know, when, when, when these discussions are happening. And I think this is also one of the strong arguments for these uh, very participatory approaches that we develop or that we try to develop during this transition disciplinary research, which I also have to say that this is way easier said than done. I mean, it, it is very complicated and we can discuss about this, but it's worth uh, it's worth trying because I think that the satisfaction, I personally, whenever I have, I've been involved in, uh, in some of these projects, the satisfaction of knowing that when this project is over, I mean, it's still, it's a long way before it is really implemented. You just generate the knowledge, you raise awareness, you have some immediate impact, but then, you know, the implementation or the adoption of some of these solutions, I mean, happens way beyond, you know, the lifetime of the project. But when you see uh, from the local perspective and the stakeholders perspective that they really have come to a solution that they think, you know, that it's fair on the one hand, realistically feasible as well, because I think we have not to forget that many of these decisions and many of these projects are being cooked, you know, on very high levels. And then you want to go down to the ground and you want to implement uh, those policies and those solutions. And you encounter even local policymakers and decision makers saying, how on earth I'm going to be able to do this? You know, I mean, we just need to adapt these, uh, these policies to our local context and it will not, it, it doesn't simply fit uh, everywhere. No? So you mentioned that it's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> and I have to admit, that's also the thought that was foremost in my mind listening to you explain it. It sounds great. Uh, and I can see both the practical reason and the moral reason for doing it. But it also sounds really hard. I don't know. Do you want to 
say a bit about that. What are the challenges of working or trying to work in a transdisciplinary way? <laughs> there is plenty, plenty, uh, plenty of challenges. I think there is challenges in terms of, you know, uh, having to work with uh, many different people that come from many different domains. Uh, so we speak very different languages. Also, we as scientists, as opposed to maybe policymakers, we have different, we are driven by different kind of incentives, you know, or we have different... Uh, no, different uh, timelines as well. And, and I mean, why not? We also somehow have also different agendas, no? generally, generally speaking. So reconciling or, or trying to reach a consensus on that, it's, uh, it takes a lot of, uh, it takes a lot, a lot of time. And actually when doing these uh, research projects, the, often we are, we are very constrained as researchers because of course we do this in the frame of funding, I mean funding calls no, and funding projects. And these, uh, these calls normally have certain timeline. I mean, I, there are projects, you know, with, uh, I don't know, they're funded for three, four years. And when you uh, have to start one of these uh, transdisciplinary processes from the scratch, uh, you can spend easily uh, more than half of your project, if not all the project, <laughs> almost sometimes, just trying to build these relationships, build this trust, build this understanding, and having some consensus about what actually can be uh, can be done. So, and by the time you finish the project, you know you are supposed, you know, to uh, to start doing your publications and so on. So there is basically. And no time. So it is. It is very challenging, and within academia, and there is a lot of ongoing discussions right now. I think the landscape is changing, but the incentives for us as scientists to do this are also very hard, because normally our performance is measured by our scientific impact, so the excellence of the research that we do, uh, the number of publications that we have, and less and less. Although I I hope that this is changing, but uh, less because of the social impact of our research, which is also very difficult to measure, but. Let's say that for us as scientists, if we want to pursue our career, there is little incentives in actually going into this very complex landscape. And the another important thing uh, is that uh, we also need to get trained because none of us was trained as a transdisciplinary scientist. I'm a biologist and I'm these days facilitating participatory process. So I had to learn, I had to learn by doing basically and learn from others, of course. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, these are skills that also as scientists, we probably do not receive currently in our curriculums and that we need to, uh, to work on. So there is a specific challenges for us as scientists, you know, to embark ourselves in these transdisciplinary approaches. And then when you start interacting with the policymakers, uh, stakeholders, uh, you need to overcome also a lot of barriers. Yeah, I bet. So I think for me, the, the most important challenge really rests in the, in the current scientific system and, and the funding environment. Because if you really want to do proper transdisciplinary research, you already need to invest a lot of time in developing this research before you even have some funding for doing it. So you should actually write research proposals jointly with uh, those stakeholders that you want to involve uh, in the project itself. And none of the funding streams, none of the research funding streams is really up for that task. And uh, then, of course, we are also maneuvering in this publish and perish environment. And it's becoming easier, but still not as easy as disciplinary science to publish in high ranking journals, these transdisciplinary processes. And what I'm actually very interested in is evaluating transdisciplinary processes. So to find out is this what we are doing actually effective? Does it lead to anything? What, what kind of impact does it have? So what you would need is actually a separate research project to evaluate the effectiveness of your previous research project. And this, this is even more complicated in the current funding environment to find a funder that would give you funding for two or three years to do this evaluation process. And if you want to evaluate these processes properly, you would need a couple of years in the future. You would need a control group. You would need to find out what would be the counterfactual. So it's it's a really tricky thing. And we are trying it in some smaller projects to also do some evaluation of specific aspects of effectiveness. But I think this should really become key and a, a standard thing in transdisciplinary processes because overall we are working with tax money and we want to find out is it actually 
any good what we are doing. Because so far we have anecdotal evidence, there's very little scientific evidence about the effectiveness of transdisciplinary research and co-production processes. And I know why there is so little, because it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to find funding. It's really hard to implement these kind of evaluation processes in reality. And it's very hard to publish this stuff afterwards. Just as a positive note, I mean, I think this aspect that Thomas has just raised about evaluating the you know, the impact of uh, transdisciplinary research, I think that has not been overcome yet. But I'm happy to see actually, and we had recently a um, conference session during the IASA's 50th birthday where we were inviting some funders. Uh, to actually speak about what initiatives they are taking to actually support and promote this transdisciplinary research. And I mean, maybe these are small efforts within the whole funding landscape or science, you know, that we have uh, globally. But I think there is some very good um, initiatives and ideas being taken forward. And I think that there is some funding streams that are actually taking this more seriously and some interesting good practices. I mean, if we also want to speak about, you know, things, you know, that that might help uh, supporting this kind of, uh, of research. As in some of these fundings, uh, basically what they are also pretty much supporting at the beginning, especially of transdisciplinary projects, is the, so to say, the creation of multi-stakeholder platforms. So when before even the call goes out, you know, there is an extensive and inclusive dialogue, you know, with different stakeholders regarding the issue that it's a stake, whether it is a I don't know, SDGs or it is, uh, you know, uh, sustainable cities or is any other topic. So there is this initial consultation where everyone, scientists, stakeholders or policymakers are invited to actually try to co-design this, this uh, solution. No, not sorry, these solutions, but this kind of a... Uh, uh, calls and projects, topics that can be addressed. And then there is even some seed funding to actually support the development of these uh, networks. Because as I was saying at the beginning or earlier, uh, you have, I mean, sometimes you spend more than half of your project trying to build a stakeholder network and build the trust and the mutual understanding. One can wonder, I mean, this this should be already from the beginning, you know, and then, and then you should actually start working. So there is actually now funding calls that are trying also, they're putting this seed grants uh, to facilitate the, this network uh, development. And I think this is a, this is a very nice uh, idea that put us, you know, in this pathway to actually make, you know, these transdisciplinary projects more feasible no? with the timeframes that we are often given and the resources that we are often given because, yeah, I mean, resources are not endless, no? And, and these are very, very expensive also. Uh, this can be also expensive uh, projects if you really take serious the participatory component because uh, this cannot be done just with one meeting at the beginning of a project and another meeting at the end of a project. I mean, when we talk, Thomas and myself, when we talk about participatory processes, we take this seriously and, and we, we actually think that this is this is a core um, element, you know, in the in the co-production uh, process. So it requires a very uh, intense collaboration and, and engagement. Yeah. At the same time, I think the scientific community also needs a bit of self-criticism and, and reflection because I get the impression that very often terms transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary co-production are used in a kind of buzzword dropping manner. So you read, you read it everywhere. Every call, uh, Horizon Europe call, other research calls ask for this kind of research. Then you write these kind of research proposals and I don't always get the impression that even the reviewers really know what transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary research actually means and, and should mean. So sometimes there are quite some surprises what kind of projects get funded, uh, promising transdisciplinary research, and eventually it's a bit of multidisciplinary research still. But it's a learning process. And I agree with Barbara, there have been some very important promising steps forward, but at the same time, we have to be careful as, as researchers also to keep up the high standards of doing truly transdisciplinary research. Yeah. So you've mentioned co-production a few times, and yes, it, it is a bit of a buzzword. Interestingly, though, I think when people talk about co-production or co-creation, which I've always assumed is synonymous, no one's ever corrected me yet, perhaps you will. Anyway, when people talk about these things in the context of the science policy interface, they normally mean... I think, a collaboration between scientists and policymakers. 
you know, working with policymakers to understand what they need and involve them in the research along the way. But then here, I think you're talking about collaborating with a much wider range of people in the community than just policymakers. Yes, I mean, the way I see it, um, I think that we we are both coming, uh, Thomas and myself, I think we are both coming from the stream that we like to do this kind of co-production processes also bottom up and not only necessarily top down. You with the policymaker trying to decide what's best for a community living uh, 500 or a thousand kilometers or a few thousand kilometers uh, away from your home. And for me, and coming from a very practical perspective, my I, I am fully convinced that despite the difficulties of, deal, of doing a bottom up approaches, I mean, already top down can be difficult because just to understand policymakers, what they need, you know, what is their enabling environment and so on, that's already difficult. But then there is this ad- additional layer of complexity when you do bottom up is because I encounter myself a lot of occasions working in projects um, at the local level where you actually talk to uh, farmers or I don't know, um, I mean, I, I work, the most, uh, work uh, mostly in the space of water. So projects related to agricultural water management or um, I don't know, service providers from uh, urban water supply, etc. They say, oh yeah, these policymakers from the European Commission, you know, I mean, they, they develop all these policies, but then we need to implement them and actually these kind of solutions or options that we are given are actually not the most suited ones for the context where we are culturally, physically, etc. So I think it's very important that uh, this bottom-up approach is embedded because uh, then a lot of money is going into implementation of these policies and there is a lot of failures as well because sometimes there is no the capacities and I mean now maybe I'm talking more about when we go to uh, the global south I mean we we export certain type of know-hows and technology and then you try to implement and then on the ground and then you find yourself yet, you know, there is simply no capacities to run these technologies or these solutions, but maybe others that will be actually cheaper at some point and, and more suited. So I think this is why it's absolutely uh, needed this uh, this bottom-up. And there, I think there is these two streams, no? the more top-down and the bottom-up. One might wonder as well whether we can always do bottom-up approaches everywhere. I mean, maybe that's also not uh, really feasible so it's not a magic solution that should be applied universally but I just think that it is very necessary to go uh, beyond you know you and the policymaker we need to get out of these ivory towers and go down to the field Hmm. that's great but I also want to ask do policymakers know that this is something of value to them I mean it might seem obvious that more inputs are always better and if the inputs coming from people who have a stake in what you're doing then that's obviously good but policymakers also face a lot of constraints in their roles some of which you referred to like resource limits and political feasibility and so on and it's hard enough sometimes getting a policymaker to see what they can do with even like a pure science input in the context that they work in never mind if you bring them a set of complicated variables generated bottom up over years and years right might they just respond with something like i asked you a simple question i know the situation is complicated i mean you don't have to tell me that what i hoped you as a scientist could bring is just some simple clear facts that i could use to help me resolve the complexity does that make any sense i'm basically asking do policymakers really want this stuff i i think increasingly so yeah i think increasingly so not in every context, not everywhere on this planet, but I think uh, policymakers are realizing it. So, so maybe it's best to give an example. And if we if we take the example of climate policies, for example, aiming at tackling the climate crisis, we consider the latest results of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It becomes quite apparent that limiting global warming to 1.5 degree, 2 degree above pre-industrial levels, will require transformational changes in all parts of society and in all areas of our lives. And this more and more policy and decision makers are realizing. And to that end, climate policies will also have to be implemented that will affect all of us in more or less strong ways. So it becomes apparent also to decision and policy makers that probably we cannot just develop another climate and energy strategy, put it on the desk and tell everyone do that. And uh, In Austria, I can provide you an example. So together with other Austrian scientists and experts in stakeholder participations, 
Some researchers from our Yaso research group have been tasked by the provincial government, government of Styria, this is one of Austria's nine provinces, to develop a participatory process for creating a bottom-up vision for a climate-resilient Styria. The aim of this process, uh, which we called climate modernity, was not only to raise awareness of the climate crisis and the policies that will be needed to tackle them, but much more so to provide a safe space for those affected to advance their claims and to co-generate a vision that might be politically feasible, more feasible than if it was would have just been developed top down. Our results actually show that the participants in this process indeed co-created quite a transformational vision of a climate resilience theory in 2100, Le looking completely different than what we are experiencing now. And these participants were carefully selected so that we have a representative sample of the whole Styrian population. And what I found most interestingly, our results show that at a statistically significant level, we saw a change in the trust in representative democracies if, as we have it here in Austria. So these kind of processes can really reestablish trust in democracies. And if, um, and as we're already speaking about trust, such processes can also re or increase the trust in science again. So at least in Austria and in, also in many other parts of the world, we see increasing skepticism against science. We see fake news, we see alternative facts. And with these kind of processes, we can also, you know, better link again to society, to different parts of society, not only pol political decision makers, but also to, to lay people, to industries, to uh, different uh, lobby groups. It's not easy, as Barbara said, it's, it's really a hard thing. And so I'm, my background is economic modeling. And I always thought, okay, wow, economic modeling, that's, that's tough science. But then I started to move more into the social sciences and participatory processes. And I can tell you working with people, that's tough. Science. That's it. <laughs> I will agree to that. That's the toughest, uh, the toughest part. I don't even know what they are called so, uh, soft signs because it's uh, it's really tough. Uh, it's very rewarding but very difficult as well. Indeed, Barbara. So we always talk about soft systems analysis, and and this is like an umbrella term for these kind of processes that we are we are using. And very often I think, oh, actually, that's hard system sciences and and the the modeling. I mean, I don't want to play it down, and, and I'm still doing modeling, but. It's it's a different thing sitting in your office in a nice Austrian castle and working on your models than going out in the field and working with stakeholders who have very different worldviews, very different ideas of what the problem actually is. And then the solutions, of course, are even more different. And then you have conflicts and you have to work with these conflicts constructively so that in the end you find a beneficial compromise solution that everyone can live with. That's a tough thing, yeah? <laughs> Well, I'm impressed that you work at an Austrian castle. That's quite an image. I hadn't realized Yas is so, so uh, well endowed. But just to kind of press the point on what I asked a minute ago. So despite all this, you find that the outcomes are still genuinely useful, I guess, and deployable by policymakers. Can they implement what you come up with? Well, it's not directly implementable. So this process in, in Austria that I just described, I think the more important thing of this and, and other climate assemblies that we see in other parts of the world. It really supports policy and decision makers in terms of showing what the uh, society is actually willing to accept in terms of climate policies, in terms of sustainability policies. So policymakers can say, OK, we have developed this uh, vision of a climate resilient future. The society is willing to go quite far, is willing to undertake quite some transformational changes. It's now our task to really bring this down on the ground and implement it in terms of, of policies and, and solutions. But it's really a support tool, I think, for these then later democratic processes. I was just, uh, I was just thinking that I, I think I referred to it uh, earlier when I was saying that, I mean, in most of these cases with these projects, even, you know, if you somehow succeed, uh, you know, in, uh, in trying to bring, I mean, first of all, not, it's not always about trying to bring solutions because, I mean, I think this is a step-by-step -step process. Sometimes uh, with these projects that, that we embark ourselves in transdisciplinary projects, what we actually try to achieve or what we are uh, ending up uh, to achieve 
rather than coming you know, to a solution is sometimes also building networks. And uh, many of the occasions and the projects that I've been working, many of the stakeholders realize and acknowledge that they barely have any chance to discuss these complex topics that they are all affected by in uh, any way or the other, because there, there is no, so to say, formats, you know, in which they can have these discussions. So sometimes these projects at the end, rather than coming with the ultimate solution, they, it's, it's a kind of a seed, you know, that you have planted where people have exchanged many of these, many, many of these views and generated, um, if it's not a, a consensus, I mean, maybe it's not a fully harmonized, all agreed, uh, you know, way of how to move forward, but at least they have built some consensus about what are the issues and what are the next steps that need to be taken. So with this, I want to say that um, sometimes the impacts are not going, you know, that level beyond on, you know, translating directly into implementation uh, because Sometimes it's a long way forward, but um, I think they help uh, creating the space, which is sometimes very much needed because in sustainability science, we face very, very complex problems with multiple spillovers. And that means that many people are affected and many of these people don't even talk to each other for many different reasons. So I think this is also another, I would say, another positive uh, aspect, you know, of, of, um, of having these, these processes. Okay, so I want to ask, and maybe the answer to this is also very obvious, but I want to ask you anyway. I always wonder, when people talk about a new paradigm or a big new way of doing science of whatever type, we've been doing science as a society for I don't know how long, centuries at least, depends how you define it. And the research culture that scientists work in, which you described, Barbara, a few minutes ago as being one of the challenges in doing this new stuff. That culture grew up in a particular context to support the particular way of doing science. And now we have this new methodology, which you argue is what we need to address the problems we face now. My question is, why now? Have we suddenly got new kinds of problems that we didn't have before, so we need this new way of doing things? Or is it that we've actually just now learned that our old way of approaching science could always have been improved um, and we're finally getting around to improving it? Well, maybe it's, uh, no, I actually, I will argue it's more about the first. I mean, uh, it's, I mean, I, I think it's a kind of a luxury that we as scientists would just, you know, sit back and chill out uh, while we are experiencing, you know, uh, the many, the many problems that we have ahead of us. So I think it's, uh, is just another branch of the of science that that has to develop in response to these societal uh, needs that that we have, and I think yeah, there is there is many scientists which might not feel comfortable because they might want to design themselves, you know what uh, what is the questions they would like to answer, and I think here we have a different kind of approach because it's not so much my own personal interest on what I want to do, uh, but more how can I bring or combine my skills with a, a question that needs to be answered because, you know, there is a lot of things at stake for people. I would add that transdisciplinary research or co-production methodologies are, are not needed in every circumstance. So it's really, I think, for those questions and, you know, where we see increasing complexity with associated with the most pertinent societal challenges like climate change, biodiversity loss, resource management. So where there is a very complex decision-making problem, these are oftentimes called wicked problems in the literature and they are characterized by the fact that there is no simple or elegant problem solution available that is only based on one view. So there's not just a technological fix we can implement. It's way more complicated and complex to find a solution. Not even the problem definition finds a compromise in these wicked problems. So actors with very different worldviews often perceive a problem very differently and already put a very different research question and problem definition. Uh, and then we talk about the solution, which is also very complex to arrive at. Uh, my research group, for example, has worked case study site in Italy, finding a, a solution for landslide management. And this was a research project going on over three, four, five years until there was finally a, a compromise solution reached. And now a couple of years after this compromise solution was even implemented. So this was a, a very interesting a uh, case study, I think, of a transdisciplinary process that also showed that there are very different worldviews and that you have to address and work with all these worldviews in a respectful, safe space that can be provided by proper co-production methodologies. 
Okay, so we're getting towards the end of this conversation now, but I have to ask, Thomas, you mentioned that you occasionally still get to do what you <laughs> originally signed up for, which was modeling. Barbara, does that go for you too? Do you still get to, well, I don't know what your original research involved, poking cells in a Petri dish? Or <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, I don't do any lab work. Uh, no, I used to be a modeler as well. Uh, but uh, no, I'm basically also doing some, uh, still doing some um, non-participatory or uh, work, um, basically yeah, working on issues related to governance uh, on water resources. So um, yeah, I do also uh, try to uh, to do some uh, research. And actually, for me, the the most satisfactory aspect of bringing this transdisciplinary research is that you can still perfectly write uh, scientific papers which have uh, the scientific excellence that is required, and they have this um, this sense of also being. Um, how to say that down to earth, you know, I mean, you are, you are actually not speculating or imagining how things should be or what solutions, but you are actually, um, getting, you know, this ingredient or this component of uh, how reality works. So I'm, I'm talking about this because we are lately working on developing a framework for, um, what means how to operationalize water security. Water security is one of these concepts that it's a bit fussy, you know, it's, it's difficult to say everyone talks about it, but what is it water security? No. So we, um, we developed for the, the world bank, a project where they had this conceptual kind of approach and we were trying to, um, uh, uh, operationalize this so that means developing a methodology and testing this methodology with uh, in a number of countries in the in the Balkans so it has a you know a very scientific component from the perspective that we are developing a approach but then of course we are a methodology but then we are uh, still of course um, bringing the participatory component uh, into the method so yeah I still do a combination of um, of both I think Barbara is actually referring to a very interesting and important aspect so that participation can happen at very different levels. So it can go all the way to truly transdisciplinary research from, you know, day one until the end of a research project, but it can also be just, just elements. So also as a modeler, I've also done participatory modeling, for example, um, where we uh, assessed uh, future energy scenar scenarios for Morocco where we use the models in a participatory setting to co-generate and co-create scenarios that we then assessed and then we played and feedbacked the results uh, to, to sharpen the scenarios again. So this is also one level of participation, but it's, it's different to other aspects. So also in our modeling work at YAS, and we have many modelers, many quantitative modelers, I think there is ample opportunity to really inject more participatory elements in, in what we are doing. And we see it in, in many research groups programs at YASA already that uh, this participatory element is becoming increasingly important as well as the, the justice and equity element is becoming increasingly important. So yeah, I think this kind of research um, can, can really be very helpful and, and useful for many different areas of research, different quantitative, qualitative backgrounds. And ultimately, it's about marrying these qualitative and quantitative systems analysis methods to really solve our global grand challenges. Wonderful. I think the sign of a good conversation, at least for me, is I get this sense of slight frustration, but kind of good frustration at the end that we didn't get to explore more of the very interesting topics that we've touched on. And I certainly feel that today. Um, we've talked about a lot of ideas in a short time, and now I want to go back and unpack them all properly. And I can't because time is up. So, um, oh, before I finish, I, I want to put in my customary plug now to listeners for our growing Slack community, which is becoming quite a nice place to meet other listeners to the podcast and indeed some past and future guests. And unlike every other podcast listeners community in the world, you don't have to join our Patreon or give us any money because uh, everything we do is completely free, thanks to the generosity, unwitting or otherwise, of the European taxpayer. Um, and that includes our Slack channel. So anyone listening to this can follow the link in the show notes and come and join us. If you've heard anything on the episode today that sparked an idea or left you screaming at the computer screen or whatever device you're listening on, 
Um, then don't scream alone. Scream at other listeners in our Slack community. It's also a good place to make connections uh, and do general networking. Link in the show notes. So anyway, back to the matter at hand. Thomas Shinko and Barbara Villats, thank you both so much. A pleasure, Toby. Thank you for the invitation, Toby. Yeah. Yes, thank you for inviting us. The Science for Policy podcast is created by Sapea. It's produced by me, Toby Wardman, with additional research and support from Agnieszka Pietruchuk. Sapea is a consortium of Europe's academy networks representing more than 100 academies, young academies and learning societies from more than 40 countries across Europe. We're part of the European Commission's scientific advice mechanism, and as such, we're funded by the European Union. Having said that, the opinions you hear on this podcast are those of the guests, and sometimes mine, but certainly not the views of the European Commission. This music is composed by Carlo Alfredo Piatti and performed by Elisaveta Suschenko. And this last bit is particularly good. <laughs>